Hi! If you're watching this, then welcome to my mini-series on terror management theory and music in animated film, titled Mortality's Wilting Flower. This is a chapter-based mini-series that I've completed for my university's honors project, and I'll be posting these to my channel in case anyone is interested. So thank you in advance for your time, and I hope y'all enjoy! So, to begin, we've all seen an animated movie at one point or another, whether it was when we were kids, or if you still watch them today, their unique format beckons to us. It presents this world that's outside our own and immediately adjacent to it. It's the painted refraction of mankind. But buried in the heart of animated films are these dark themes, Problems that lie in the bedrock of humanity. We prepare to distract ourselves from our own existence with the light and wonder of animation, but these films catch us off guard and wash us with the core truth. Nothing lasts forever, not even you. But humans are like bright flowers in a garden. Not beautiful because they last forever but because they are beautiful for only a short period, and therefore all the sweeter. But that doesn't make the looming terror any easier. And as this passes through us, we fall into ourselves. We're confronted with emotions that were unexpected when we sat down for some light entertainment. We shield ourselves in our cultural beliefs. We turn the film off if it's upsetting us. We soothe ourselves by reinstating our subconscious denial of death. The ways in which we accomplish this is based on a concept called terror management theory. Terror management theory, or TMT, is a type of defensive human thinking and behavior that stems from an awareness and fear of death. Over time, developing to encompass both death and death reminiscent offense, but we'll get to that later. Our prevalent knowledge of impending death has permeated every aspect of human activity since the dawn of humans. Martin Luther once said, Every man must do two things alone. He must do his own believing and his own dying. Walt Whitman said, Nothing can happen more beautiful than death. And the list goes on. Buddha said, Even death is not to be feared by one who has lived wisely and countless modern authors have commented on this as well. John Green wrote, Grief does not change you, it reveals you. Christopher Paolini wrote, The songs of the dead are the lamentations of the living. Paolini said that on page one of his book, Eldest. Hundreds of experimental studies have been completed on terror management theory. However, music as a study has been largely neglected in terror management studies. It's not that there is no movie without a musical score, because of course they exist, but music has a proverbial immediate tether to the soul, and is able to communicate pure emotion without words or pictures. There are many methods depicted and utilized for terror management theory in animated films, and the musical score only enhances this effect. There are 10 films examined in this 10-part series. I've included them on the screen and elected not to list them out for you because the phrasing was lengthy and awkward. You're welcome to pause the video for a closer look. In this mini-series, we're going to explore visual, linguistic, and musical analyses, a multifaceted approach of animated films to uncover their methods in utilizing terror management, and how music contributes to this experience. We are most effective in our denial of death when we explore death in the safe and cathartic environment of animation. Let's address some key questions that lies the foundation of these series. What is terror management theory? Why address music within the context of terror management? Why use animation as a medium at all to address these concepts? To quote Mitch Albom's infamous mentor, Maurice Schwartz, let's begin with this idea. Everyone knows they're going to die, but nobody believes it. Terror management theory was founded by American anthropologist Ernest Becker. According to Becker, humans have had a natural thrill for the theater of heroism 
that dates back to before the Epic of Gilgamesh. He maintains that man's underlying urge to heroism lies in the idea of narcissism. As humans, we are hopelessly absorbed with ourselves, and our working level of narcissism is inseparable from our need to feel secure in our self-esteem. Humans are paradoxical by nature. Becker says that we are half animal, half symbolic, out of nature and hopelessly in it. He says that man is literally split in two. He has an awareness of his own splendid uniqueness and that he sticks out of nature with the towering majesty, and yet he goes back into the ground a few feet in order blindly and dumbly to rot and disappear forever. The awareness of death was a byproduct of our evolution. Our ancestors developed symbols to ponder images that were not immediately available to their senses enabling them to better learn from the past and plan for the future. This in turn bred language and the creation of the pronoun I, which according to Becker himself, served as a symbolic rallying point for self-consciousness by giving each individual a precise designation of her or himself. An overwhelming fear of death would have been a deadened evolutionary barrier and a recipe for extinction. So early humans made an adaptive, imaginative leap and placed themselves in the center of an extraordinary, transcendent, and eternal universe. The basis of terror management theory lies in the concepts of literal and symbolic immortality, or as Dr. Audrey Cardini, professor of music and terror management theory author, phrased it, each individual's immortality project. Literal immortality is exactly as it sounds living forever, whether it be within your own body or another one constructed. Symbolic immortality is the legacy that you leave behind after you die, by way of family, wealth and fortune, heroic nationalism and charismatic leaders, fame and religion. Becker tells us that humans tell themselves vital lies to repress death anxiety that deny their vulnerability and grant literal or symbolic immortality, all the while recognizing the falseness and necessity of these illusions. As humans, we cannot help but deny death to live in a world where we know that we will die. When we're successful in our strive towards self-esteem, we're successful in our denial of death. Since most people are indoctrinated into this cultural belief system from early childhood, most existential terror remains subconscious. Therefore, most people are unaware of the defensive function of their cultural belief system. Terror management functions as a shield between us and our realities. Reminders of death inflict reactionary reversion into our cultural beliefs, like our beliefs will physically protect us. And vice versa, when others challenge our core values, this naturally leads to increased subconscious thoughts of death. When humans were learning that socializing was beneficial, they developed rituals, which are believed to have then spawned the development of myth, religion, and art. Social psychologist Sheldon Solomon writes that rituals are the behavioral bedrock of human culture. As wishful thinking and action, rituals empower us to sustain life, forestall death, and manage the universe. They assure our success in love and war. They determine who we are. You're not an adult until ritually fashioned into one. Ritual determines when you're married. You're not even considered fully dead until the official ritualizers, the doctor, coroner, preacher, declare you to be. Man's creation of art has long been held as one of our most defining traits. Solomon adds, without art, the crudeness of reality would make the world unbearable. Music is a key component of art, and by extension, of culture. Musical activities have been present in every known culture on Earth, but the study of music itself has been largely neglected by terror management theory researchers instead only acknowledged that music is a part of culture and is used to separate humans from animals, signify worldviews, and aid in self-esteem development. Despite its absence in the literature, music is undeniably tied to terror management theory. Pianist and conductor Daniel Barenboim states that music is more than a mirror of life. 
It is enriched by the metaphysical dimension of sound, which gives it the possibility to transcend physical human limitations. In the world of sound, even death is not necessarily final. By providing sensations that are pleasurable and allow us to live in a symbolic world, music provides a safe window frame through which to examine death. Cardney writes, the power of art to make real the unreal through a concrete expression of a worldview bolsters one's faith in that worldview. Music and the arts mediate between life and death by giving form to death while we live, and essential for the arts given that the dead cannot describe their experiences for others. Cardney ends her analysis by stating that further investigations are necessary to explore the role of death and life through music. For me, this is a call to action. In the following analyses, I will explore how the use and effect of musical scores and songs aid in terror management in the storyline and visual elements of animated films. Themes of death are prevalent throughout human history, and researchers believe that it's because tragic art it provides a culturally sanctioned, cathartic but safe encounter with the idea of death. This concept precisely encapsulates why there are such dark themes present in our animated films. It is a culturally sanctioned, cathartic but safe encounter with an idea that's nothing short of a bleak inevitability. Animation is a signal for viewers that they are viewing a world in which everything is possible. The rules of physics and logic don't apply due to the effects of conventional art forms. And yet the rules of death still apply, albeit to an extent, and invariably so. Animated films are largely thought to be for and directed at children. However, this just isn't true. The depictions of end-of-life events that occur in most animated films can provide critical opportunities for discussing death and dying processes with children and adults alike. This misconception could be due to the fact that, although they are not solely for children, they are very beneficial to childhood mental development. Studies agree that a child has no knowledge of death until about the age of 3 to 5. Before that, the idea of death is too abstract, too removed from one's experience. But gradually, one realizes that there is a thing called death that takes some people away forever, and will sooner or later take everyone away but that realization can take up till the age of 9 or 10. So animated films help work to nurture this realization, while simultaneously soothing it with built-in methods for terror management, or moving on. Young adult author Cassandra Clare comments, There is truth in stories. Fiction is truth even if it is not fact. If you believe only in facts and forget stories, your brain will live, but your heart will die. The significance of a cinematic experience extends far beyond its entertainment value due to the passive nature of film narratives. It enables individuals to explore their own feelings by connecting with characters and observing experiences that may otherwise be difficult to comprehend, increasing awareness and enlarging personal perspective. Viewing a film forces the primacy of emotional response by evoking feelings of joy, sorrow, or anger without the first-hand experience of responsibility within the real world. Distance between the sensitized reality within the film and the viewer's own physical reality allows the viewer to experience the challenging events in a more palatable way. This can be especially true for situations that create distress and anxiety, such as death or dying. The way that we see death portrayed can influence individuals' perceptions and understanding of the death and dying process. Death portrayals in films can serve as an important educational tool by both illustrating death and exploring the influence that death has in the human experience. In our next section, we'll examine how terror management theory is used in response to death anxiety. The following chapter will examine the films Coco and Brother Bear, so stay tuned. <laughs>